In this talk, um, I'm going to ah, first uh, 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 sincerely uh, acknowledgement to the organizer for your invitation and uh, organization. Okay. Okay. And uh, um, in this talk, I'm going to, to resume some of the concepts uh, introduced before by, by Adrian, and I want to, to leverage them to, uh, to further stress uh, our contribution towards uh, uh, explainable AI and sustainable uh, AI. So, uh, as we have seen uh, before in the previous talks and uh, as we see every day in our life, um, nowadays um, machine learning and uh, neural networks, deep learning and so on, are providing uh, great successes in a very broad range of fields. Uh, however, most of these uh, successes are mainly based on an experimental ground. So we still do not have uh, a full theoretical control on what, what's going on uh, therein. And uh, uh, so there is uh, great efforts uh, nowadays to, to, to reach uh, some uh, control there. And uh, there are several reasons for that. First, uh, if, I have, uh, if I reach a control on uh, what's going on there, then uh, I can uh, um, determine for a given task uh, that I want the machine to accomplish, which is uh, the minimal architecture, I mean the minimal number of layers or the minimal number of neurons, which ensures that uh, the network performs correctly. And this, of course, means uh, uh, great advantages in terms of uh, time and, uh, and energy. And uh, another point is that uh, if I have a control on how this machine is working uh, on uh, on the underlying mechanisms underlying the, the, the functioning of, uh, of this machine, uh, then when these machines are, are used to take uh, decisions, then I can also guarantee that these decisions are uh, explainable and hopefully fair. And uh, now to, to cope uh, with, uh, with this problem, uh, we have uh, several tools and several perspectives and uh, several uh, models. And uh, here I will focus on a very specific uh, point of view that is uh, statistical mechanics. And from this point of view, uh, we look at uh, uh, the neurons making up this, uh, this model as interacting uh, units, and I wanted to interpret their information processing capabilities as emerging collective behaviors. So, as anticipated by um, Adriano, I want to, to look at the behavior of these machines um, similarly to, uh, to, to a physical system, and uh, uh, I wanted to uh, detect which are the key parameters of uh, uh, the neural networks, such that by tuning these parameters, the network exhibits different, qualitatively different behaviors. So, for instance, uh, this is just a sketch. Um, the, the key parameters that determine the behavior of the system may be related to its architecture, for instance, the depth, the number of uh, hidden layers, or might be related to uh, the training data set. Here, M represents um, the number of instances in the training data set. And by tuning parameters like this, I want to highlight different capacities, different abilities of the system. For instance, it may range from an underfitting regime to an overfitting regime. And of course, if I know in advance, if I have this knowledge in advance, then I can detect the correct architecture to perform the task, or I give up because the number of examples that I have are insufficient for uh, my resources. Okay, now I will introduce the model from the very scratch. Sorry for being boring. Um, then a, a, a neural network is a graph, uh, of course, where each node is occupied by a neuron and the connection between the two neurons are interpreted as the synaptic connection between the neurons. 
and uh, uh, inspired by uh, the functioning of uh, a biological neural network, I associate to, to each neuron uh, a variable, sigma i for neuron i, which represents the state of that neuron. And uh, um, I, I will assume that these uh, uh, variables are binary, uh, mimicking uh, the active or quiescent state of a neuron. And uh, um, as for, for links, I associate to each link a weight, and uh, again, mirroring uh, the functioning of, uh, of the brain, uh, these, um, uh, these weights can be taken as, uh, as real, and importantly, they can be uh, positive or negative, and this mirrors the fact that the synapses can be excitatory or inhibitory. Now, both the sigmas and the j's are dynamic random variables, but they live on different time scales. The sigmas are much faster than the, the j's, so uh, in the following I will uh, take the, the j's as uh, quenched, as uh, frozen, and I will just focus on the dynamics of the sigma. And uh, here is uh, the, the evolutionary rule for the state of neuron i at time uh, uh, t plus 1, which depends on the state of uh, neurons at the previous time. So uh, this uh, phi is uh, the field acting on neuron i at time t, and uh, it is determined by the, the state of the neighboring uh, neurons. And uh, then there is also this um, um, uh, contribution, which is a stochastic term. Zi is a random variable and T is a parameter which tunes the degree of stochasticity. So if T is equal to zero, then, then the dynamics is deterministic, while if T goes to infinity, then uh, uh, neurons are fully random. They are Rademacher random variable, plus one or minus one with uh, equal probability. Okay, skip the details, but one can show that uh, uh, if these uh, Zi uh, are drawn from uh, a reasonable uh, degree distribution, if uh, uh, couplings, uh, these uh, uh, weights are um, symmetric and uh, the system is devoid of uh, self-loops, then there exists a unique invariant measure for this system given by this uh, expression here, where H has this um, definition. Of course, if you are familiar with the statistical mechanics, you will immediately recognize that this is the Boltzmann-Gibbs distribution for a spin-like model uh, described by this uh, Hamiltonian. And so we, we have recast this, uh, uh, um, this uh, statistical mechanic uh, setting, and uh, now I have uh, uh, a number of uh, tools and uh, concepts that I can apply to, to get a macroscopic description of the system, which tells me how and where the system can, uh, can behave uh, correctly. And uh, as uh, um, explained by, by Adriano, our goal is uh, in finding an explicit expression for the free energy. And uh, uh, to this task, uh, you can apply PDA techniques uh, as well as uh, more classical ones. Um, I will now um, uh, focus the attention on uh, a specific task that I want uh, the network to accomplish, that is a pattern rec reconstruction. Adriano used uh, uh, pictures, I, I use uh, these uh, digits. So the task is the following. Uh, uh, I assume that the network has previously um, learned, memorized, some pieces of information that are represented by, uh, by these uh, uh, digits uh, here. And now I, uh, I present to the network a corrupted version of, uh, of these uh, original patterns, like this one. This is a handwritten digits. And I want the system to give as output its reconstruction, its archetypical reconstruction. So from now on, I will uh, refer to these original patterns as archetype and to these uh, uh, corrupted uh, uh, versions as uh, examples. I denote archetypes with uh, xi, so I have a k of such uh, patterns, each represented by um, vectors, uh, binary vectors of length n. So the strategy is the following. I initialize uh, the neural configuration as uh, sigma zero, where sigma zero codify for the input. I let the system evolve according to the dynamics that I introduced before. 
and uh, I hope that the system will eventually reach uh, a stationary state corresponding to the reconstruction of uh, the archetype. And a possible way to, to realize uh, this, uh, this path is uh, to choose uh, uh, weights J in such a way that each archetype is a minimum of the Hamiltonian or cost function or energy, whatever you, you want to call it. Okay, so this is the strategy. There are several ways to, to, choose, uh, uh, to choose J in such a way that this relation holds. And uh, a very popular uh, model is uh, the Hopefield model. Here, the focus is not on a specific choice of archetypes, but rather to a class of archetypes which uh, share the same statistical properties. And uh, this class is made of uh, archetypes um, that are uh, drawn from uh, uh, Rademacher distribution. I mean, each entry is plus one or minus one with the same probability. And uh, um, I can allocate such information in weights according to, to this rule. So this rule fulfills the requirement that I showed you before. And uh, um, it can also, it is called Ebb's rule, and it can also be justified on uh, a biological ground. So the Hamiltonian, again, or cost function or energy now looks uh, like this. And I notice that uh, uh, weights can indeed be either positive or, or negative. And this has important consequences on the behavior of my system because uh, um, there emerge frustration. So look at this uh, very simple uh, network. And um, the fact that uh, uh, links have different uh, weights of different signs means that here I can find uh, a neuronal state which fulfills all these constraints uh, simultaneously. So there emerge compromises uh, among them and this generates a proliferation of local minima in, uh, in the cost function. And uh, such uh, a generation of an exponentially large number in the size of the system of local minima makes uh, the, the analysis of, uh, of this system very challenging, not only, numeric, not only analytically, but also numerically. Um, a statistical mechanics description for, for this model was, uh, was first given in the late 80s by Amit Gutfreund and Sampolinski, who were able to detect uh, uh, the, uh, the control parameters that are alpha, already defined by Adriano, and the noise T, that is the degree of stochasticity in the neuronal dynamic. And they also highlighted um, a, a good uh, observable to check the, the overall behavior of the system. So MMU uh, quantifies how good, how well uh, the system is reconstructing uh, the archetype mu. And here is the phase diagram. You see that when T is large, the system is completely useless for our scopes because neurons tend to align randomly. Uh, if you want to use this machine for reconstruction, then you have to, to tune T and alpha uh, in, in, this, in such a way that they, uh, they correspond to this blue region here. Outside, you have this wide red region where spurious state, those mentioned by, by Antonio before, prevail. So again, here, your, your machine would be useless. Um, we, we have working uh, uh, intensively on, uh, on the Hopefield model, trying to get some rigorous results. I just mentioned uh, on uh, a couple of works here where uh, we, we focus on uh, quite an important problem, that is the existence of, of this threshold here. So beyond, beyond alpha equal to 0 0.14, the system enters uh, this uh, so-called blackout scenario. So there is great enter interest in enlarging as much as possible this blue region, because if this blue region gets larger and larger, then with the same amount of resources, you can store a larger number of archetypes. And uh, uh, 
as uh, uh, also mentioned by, by Adriano, this can be done by revising uh, the definition of uh, uh, the couplings here and by inserting terms that uh, mirrors the mechanisms occurring during mammals uh, in the ba in mammals' brain during sleep. And uh, uh, the result is uh, quite striking because uh, ST, this parameter here, which can be interpreted as the sleep time, gets larger and larger, then uh, the retrieval region gets wider and wider, and you eventually reach alpha equal to one, which is the theoretical upper bound. Another reason why we are so interested in finding uh, rigorous, uh, uh, rigorous results for the hopeful model is because of its connection with uh, machine learning models, and in particular with the restricted Boltzmann machine, which uh, looks like this. This is a basic model for machine learning, um, and this is also the basic version for the restricted Boltz machine. You have a visible layer on the, on the left and a hidden layer on the right. Uh, I call sigma uh, neurons uh, in the former and Z neurons in the latter. And the W uh, is the matrix of, uh, of weights uh, on these links. Uh, again, you can introduce uh, a dynamics uh, for neuron, and you can show that uh, uh, it, uh, uh, the system eventually reaches this uh, distribution, which can be interpreted as a Boltzmann-Gibbs distribution for a bipartite spin glass described by this uh, Hamiltonian. And uh, this kind of, uh, of network can be uh, exploited, for instance, uh, and not only, uh, for uh, classification tasks. So in this case, our training data set is made of uh, uh, this set of uh, instances. You, you have M examples, each made by uh, a couple of, uh, 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 of variables, so X, which is the input, and Y, which is the label for that input. And I assume that uh, these uh, instances are drawn IAD from an unknown targeted distribution that I call a Q. And uh, um, now I, uh, I should train the network based on such uh, information. And uh, training means that I have to update its weight in such a way that uh, uh, the, the, the theoretical distribution is as close as possible to the target distribution. And this can be realized by, uh, by means of uh, a learning uh, rule such as this, which is a gradient descent on the Kullback Leiber distance between Q and NP. So if you are uh, smart enough and uh, if uh, your uh, data set is uh, good enough, then uh, after training, you, you can use the machine in the following way. You initialize uh, the visible layer in uh, one uh, uh, example. You let the system uh, relax, uh, then you, you have a sigma star and Z star. And Z star provides, uh, with, uh, provides you with uh, uh, the label of uh, sigma uh, zero, of uh, the predicted label of uh, sigma zero. Okay. Uh, as said before, uh, the, the hope field uh, model is closely rela related to the uh, restricted Boltzmann machine. This is uh, just one line uh, calculation. It is just a matter of a Gaussian integration or a Hubbard Stratonovich uh, transformation according to, to the way you are uh, moving. Um, and uh, this equivalence uh, holds uh, as long as uh, uh, the weights in the Boltzmann machine correspond to the archetype entries in the Hopfield model. Okay, so can I use this uh, bridge to uh, translate uh, all the rigorous knowledge that I have uh, for the Hopfield model into the machine learning uh, scenario? Not yet, uh, because uh, uh, the Hopfield model is actually a storing model. There is no machine learning flavor there. The fact is that uh, the Hopfield model stores K archetypes that are known. They are available. They are perfectly available. While in machine learning, we, we rather have some set of examples. So to, uh, to, to recast the Hopfield model in such a scenario, we um, uh, slightly uh, revised uh, the model in the following way. Uh, so instead of uh, um, defining uh, weights uh, based on archetypes, 
we introduced m examples for each archetype, where examples are denoted as uh, eta, and they are defined in this way. So basically, uh, you, uh, you flip in, uh, in your uh, archetype a random sample of pixels. And chi is a Bernoullian random variable uh, with parameter r. So notice that r is a quality, is a parameter which quantifies uh, the quality of your data set. Because if r is equal to zero, then your data set is completely random. But if r is equal to one, then your data set is perfect. So we revise the Hebbian rule, uh, uh, taking uh, examples instead of archetype, and we have a supervised version as, and an unsupervised version. Here I focus on, on the former. We plug this into the Hamiltonian, and we perform the statistical mechanics. So I will skip all the details. I just stress that now our control parameters are, again, the noise T, the load alpha, and also parameters which are related to the data set. In principle, they are R, the quality of the data set, and M, the quantity of the data set. But they just play uh, uh, combined into this uh, uh, parameter here. So you, you, you can uh, uh, have intuition on that. You, you can prove that, and uh, the intuition you can have on that is that rho, defined in this way, represent uh, the conditional entropy of, uh, um, uh, of uh, uh, the archetypes given the data set. Okay, so again, T, alpha, and rho are our, our uh, parameters. And we, uh, we find this uh, phase diagram uh, where alpha, T, and, uh, and rho correspond to, to different transition lines. Rho equal to zero corresponds to the Hopfield model, and uh, as rho gets larger and larger, this uh, retrieval region, that is uh, the region where the system behaves correctly, it can perform for the task it is assigned, uh, gets smaller and smaller, and it eventually collapses on the alpha equal to zero axis. So, correctly, as our ignorance on the data set, as on, on the archetypes, that is, as the data set get poorer and poorer, the performance requires, uh, 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 the, the performance corresponds to, to a smaller region. So require a smaller load or a smaller noise. Um, now we, we have to, to, to get back to, to the Boltzmann machine, and uh, uh, the main results that we found are the following. If we set the weights in the Boltzmann machine as the empirical average over examples, then the equivalence still holds. Again, this is a one-line calculation. And so the phase diagram for the Hopefield model with the supervised uh, coupling still holds for the restricted Boltzmann machine. And another result is that if examples in different uh, classes, so that is, if examples <coughs> corresponding to different labels are orthogonal, are at least in the average, then this setting is also a fixed point for training. So I, I have already trained the machine with, uh, with this uh, uh, setting. There is no need for lengthy uh, learning rules. Uh, this holds as long as uh, uh, archetypes are uh, those uh, that I defined before, I mean uh, with Rademacher entries. So now the question is, here is, uh, does this hold also for a structured data set, or it is just something uh, related to this uh, academic uh, model? And to test this, we consider the MNIST uh, dataset, that is a benchmark in machine learning, and uh, uh, we have a couple of evidence, evidences. One, if you, you take this setting for weights, okay, uh, this is, uh, for structured dataset, this is no longer a, a fixed point for training. You still have uh, to do some efforts, but it is an effective pre-training. 
because uh, with respect to uh, the typical uh, initialization for waves, that is, uh, stand, uh, that is a Gaussian initialization, this is uh, an effective one. And uh, the scaling that I showed before related to the definition of uh, rho still holds. So it tells you that uh, if the quality of your data set is uh, pretty low, then uh, you have to rescale the number of examples uh, uh, accordingly. And okay, this is the, the last slide with uh, some, uh, some results that we obtain based on, on this uh, uh, equivalence between the Hopefield model and the restricted Boltzmann machine. I just want to, to comment uh, on this figure because uh, this, is, this is obtained uh, by uh, building up uh, the restricted Boltzmann machine equivalent to the Hopefield model with the sleeping mechanisms. And uh, here we, we also have some interesting uh, outcomes because uh, you can uh, check uh, the savings in terms of the number of examples that uh, you need in, in order to, uh, to, to let the system uh, uh, classify correctly. And uh, you see that uh, as uh, the sleeping time t grows, this, uh, this saving gets uh, uh, larger and larger, and for uh, some values of R, which represent, again, the quality of the data set, the, the saving can reach uh, values uh, uh, roughly around 90%. So I save the 90% of uh, the data set uh, with, uh, with these mechanisms. Okay, that's all. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the very interesting talk. Any questions? Any question online? Actually, do I have a question? So, is, uh, uh, can you explain again what is this uh, sleeping mechanism? What does, yeah, what does it mean to put uh, yeah, the network uh, asleep? Okay, uh, I have some extra slides for that oh, I expected. Right. <laughs> Fifteen more. Um, okay, yeah, I mean the following. Um, the, the mechanisms that uh, we, we have in mind are, are the following. So you, you, the, you, your brain um, undergoes an awake phase during which uh, you, you, you get new information, new pieces of information to store. Uh, a rapid eye movement phase during which, ah, creak, <laughs> uh, during which uh, um, you, you, you have dreams. And this has been related to some uh, um, reverse learning mechanisms. I mean, during that phase, you erase your brain from uh, um, uh, patterns that are considered as unimportant or they're just by mistake. And then there is a slow wave motion. Uh, this is a very deep uh, uh, sleep uh, during which there is evidence of so-called synaptic consolidation. So during that phase, the, the patterns that are considered as important are consolidated. So uh, my cartoon picture is that during sleep you have a kind of defrag of, uh, of your brain. And um, so uh, if this is uh, the landscape, your, uh, your cost function landscape, you, you want to uh, erase this uh, local minima uh, during the by, by sleeping mechanism you erase this local minima and you make this good minima deeper so you you, you should obtain a reshape of the landscape like this and uh, we we obtained uh, this uh, this scenario in this way so you revise your coupling according to this evolutionary rule where there is uh, a term for consolidation and a term for, um, uh, for dilation. And uh, you solve this, uh, uh, this equation and uh, you, you, you end up with this expression where uh, you have this extra term with respect to, uh, to, the, to the standard Hebbian rule where C, the, uh, the pattern correlation matrix, appear. So this is uh, uh, the, the biological uh, uh, inspiration. Uh, more uh, effectively, uh, this, uh, um, this kernel here provides a kind of orthogonalization of your patterns, uh, and this uh, 
makes uh, the system um, better in recognizing them because it reduces the interference between them. Uh, and so you, you avoid all these uh, local minima which are just due to interference. Uh, okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any more questions? So thank you very much. It was an amazing talk, uh, and uh, including also the one from Adriano. Uh, I have a very fancy question, so please feel free to tell me that I understood nothing. It's completely unrelated. Um, so my, my question is, there is an ongoing effort uh, in the community of people working in easing machines to map uh, uh, NP-complete problems, so problems of, uh, let's say, science of complexity in computer science, uh, into easing, into the couplings of uh, easing machine. So you explain how uh, deep learning can be modeled using upfield uh, models that are then uh, transformed in uh, Mattis Hamiltonians. Mattis Hamiltonians are essentially just easing machines with uh, I can say trivial couplings, but let's say just multiplicative couplings. Okay, so more or less you can just map uh, polynomial problems and not NP complete problems mm -hmm. uh, into these Hamiltonians. Do you think there is maybe a way to generalize this uh, model of deep learning to uh, whatever using is is Hamiltonian uh, and so prove that we can actually solve NP complete problems using machine learning? Yeah, we, we are starting to. Uh, to work on that, I mean, uh, trying to, to see if there is uh, an effective uh, mapping between uh, deep uh, uh, machine, uh, restricted Boltzmann machine with multiple uh, hidden layers and uh, uh, hopeful machines. And uh, we, we have obtained some preliminary results. Um, uh, for instance, you, you can combine some uh, uh, hopeful network, uh, building up a modular network of networks, but uh, the, the, the full theory has not been uh, reached. At least I, I still haven't it uh, clear. I don't know. Thank you. But of, of course, this, uh, this is one of the most important directions so we, we are addressing uh, our efforts indeed. Thanks. Any more questions, comments, remarks? If not, let's uh, thank Elena again. Thank you. Uh, so we have a tea, coffee break, and then uh, one more talk, and then the discussion. We resume at quarter to four. <laughs>